my great pleasure to introduce you to Kay Lewis and some of you may have read her article that was in the November, I think it was, no it was the, let me get it right, September, October, New Zealand genealogist in 2007 and there's Kay right on the front cover just in case you thought that you'd seen her. It's too hard for me to open it up and hold it up here but at least I've got a photograph on the front cover. And uh, so any of you that have been doing genealogy for a time might like to go back and reread that article. Um, really interesting about her trip to Ireland and her discovering her family there. It was, you know, really great. That was right, wasn't it? Yes. yes. <laughs> so, um, it's, so it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Kay Lewis and she's going to talk to us about the Thames Goldfields and the Goldfields in Otago. So welcome Kay. Thank you. I started this gold miners database in about 2005 and I've um, been transcribing it ever since. I've just reached 50,000 re mining records. Um, I try to be fair, half of them come from the North Island and half from the South. Um, just sticking with the gold rush itself. And as soon as the records start to, the gold miners stop coming, I stop transcribing. Uh, we, we actually have a, a user's manual for this, it's being sold at the Treasury in, in Thames. We bought a few copies here for sale, five dollars each, if you're really keen on how to use this database. But basically all you've got to do is put your name in the search box to see what you come up with. And please uh, note all the different notes, it tells you what records are actually covered by the database if you click on it. And various other answers to questions, because I get lots of, um, of questions via email. That's it. Huh? That's it. That's it. The Carnegie Library. Yeah. Um, this is the Carnegie Library. We are actually now the Treasury, operated by the Coromandel Thames Heritage Society, a Heritage Trust. Um, I'm uh, the, the webmaster. I started this web page from scratch at about the time they set up, about 2005. It's now reaching the stage where it's very useful um, for, for historical information about Thames. Uh, we've just received a large grant. We've already got the, tr the, the Carnegie Library, which is the old part of it there. It's restored and operates as a library for Thames records. We've now got a grant to build a uh, new state-of-the-art archive on, on site, next door, and uh, it's, we're actually interviewing builders right now, so it won't be long. Um, notice here, uh, uh, various buttons, our people will give you um, the mayors and, and uh, councillors and various other famous people from Thames. But, and there's also a resources button, and slowly we're trying to put in there all of our um, holdings. Um, records are pouring in now that they know we've got an archive to work with. And uh, Thames mining uh, maps and things, we're try going to have to try to restore them. They've all come out of attics from council buildings and the t school of mines and places. It's all got to be restored and re recovered from the mould and the rats and whatever, but we're going to try to get it all together in, in one place and that's really what the emphasis has been. Just below resources is journal, and that's another thing, I'm the editor of the journal. We're in our fifth year now. Um, people contribute articles. We have at least one lady I know of here who's contributed an article about the early Thames miners. But Anything to do with teams goes in here. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the work of Dave Wilton, whose uh, article you can see there right at the top, and he, all the way through the journal. He's, he's an archaeologist um, and works on mining in Thames and writes articles both uh, for the Archaeological Society uh, but also for us, the general public, and puts it in here. A lot of the stories I'm going to say to you today are just an introduction to some of Dave's work, so I'd like to acknowledge 
has, has great work in this area. But also we have other uh, authors who, of the Abarca, probably those of you who go online, have um, seen her work a lot. So, yes, plenty of information there, five volumes of it. It was quite near that big pump site where that subsidence happened. Yes, in fact, that's, that's the story. They oh. put the, uh, the latest article as the story of oh, okay. what they found in that subsidence, yeah. so if you're interested in just what happened there. But this is what the, my article's about. And uh, you can see there what the courts is like. But um, we're going back to 1867, James Mackay. He came from the South Island, he was actually a settler originally, um, but was fluent in Maori, and as time went by, he became a civil servant working for the government, um, Maori land deals, translating for the Maori, Maori problems, um, and then ultimately came to the North Island in 1867. They realised there was gold at Karenga, which is the, the old name for Thames, and sent James Mackay on the job because thing being that it was all occupied by the Maoris at the time. He was appointed as the Gold Commissioner, which is different from the Warden. Mostly his job was to negotiate land to be available for the miners. Um, <coughs> so this is 1867. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that most of these old photos come from the Treasury collection of photos. They have a huge collection. Um, we're trying to you know, restore them and uh, get them all catalogued. Right now it's a bit of a mess, but that's what we're all about. Okay, so that's a really great photo because that's the first photo that I've been able to find in the Treasury collection. And uh, you, get, you see there the Bendigo store, so it gives us the Australian connection. Lots of Australians turned up here from the um, Victorian gold fields. You can see there the meantime display. It shouldn't have taken much trouble for the dogs to get their dinner, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that gives you the first view of some of our miners. So, uh, James Mackay had a terrible struggle trying to sort out um, what the miners, where the miners could go. The Maori simply didn't want them. Uh, but in the end, he managed to negotiate a uh, five square, about five square miles coming from the Hape River here up as far as the Karanga Creek, which is here, and in, in a certain amount. So the miners, the first ones that came, or 60 of them came, in August 1867 with James Mackay and they came on the Enterprise steam paddle steamer from Auckland um, landed here on the 31st of July 1867 and spread out over those hills but James Mackay had to keep them confined to that small five square mile area what, what we call these days this Thames special area well, these are the first guys to get lucky. We have a descendant in the audience here today of Anne Clarkson. Messrs. Hunt, Coley, White and Clarkson. And they discovered the first shot over claim. So I'd just like to demonstrate how the gold miners database works. I've put in a, a search for each of those names, White, Hunt, Coley and Clarkson. Came up with Miners' right, the uh, MR on the side means miners' right, and there is a key when you bring up research results, by the way, to tell you what this means. So they're not all miners' rights. So you do need to look up the key as to what you found. In this case, it's a miners' right. Number six, seven, eight, and nine. So they were the six to ninth people to put in a claim on the 10th of August, bearing in mind they arrived the 31st of July. Um, and if you want to see the original, you can look it up, but you won't get any more than what I've already transcribed in here off that record, but at least you'll get the original. Um, 
So I think we've been at the, this is the, the gold mining database is actually grown into being started off for you genealogists that I was doing it for. I'm a genealogist myself, and I can see the beauty of having these records um, so that we can access them. However, it's become a very important historical document, documentation of what's happened, and historians all over New Zealand and Australia are using it to follow miners around the place, which is an offshoot really of the original intention, but I'm glad it's working out this way. Okay, so this is the shot over uh, with the first uh, guys here. That's what it looked like when they first arrived. One of them, we're not sure exactly which one, was climbing up that bank and was picking away at it and up popped a big lump of gold, more, more gold than quartz. So that's when they shot out into um, James Mackay's um, office, which he said was a disgusting place. Like It was a tent, and I, I get it was muddy, the rats come in under the canvas, and he said it was just a, a disgraceful place, but he called it the warden's office. So you'd shoot down there, and, and they did on the 10th of August, and, and uh, staked out four claims. You had to put corner pegs on each man's claim. And they wanted that uh, cliff face, and there was a little trickle of water coming over it, but uh, away they went. Uh, I'm not sure the dates on these photos. They all come from the treasury, and I've tried to make them in a certain amount of chronological order. But this looks like about a year later, I suppose. They've, they've take, this was the original bank, and they've taken away all of this picked away with their shovels. They've set up a little tramway here. That you can't really see it here, but there's a, I think it's there, there's a little tram. Shoot the, the ore down to here. And then they've got to work on crushing it up. Because it's quartz, quartz rock with the gold impregnated in it, I think. Um, yeah, there it is. The, the gold incorporates in it. And it's stuck hard, so you can't get it out until you crush this into sand, and then the, you can get the sand, extract the sand, the gold from the sand. And so that's what they had to do, but back in those days, they did it basically, you can see a guy there with a hammer probably, and they got to hammer it. They, had a, they took, put up a hut. Then a few years later, you can see they've dug in even further. They've got several layer, la layers going along. And they've also bought, built what I think is a battery house with a crusher, which was most likely operated with the steam. I don't know. Either that or, well, they definitely did have one a little bit later. So I'm not absolutely sure what's going on there. Uh, at first they were just uh, picking away and shoveling and getting the ore down, but later on they built shafts underneath. But this is a, a stamp of battery, um, which I think was in that house, a little one like this. You've got, if you're going to make this work, you've got to turn that shaft there. And with these cans, those of you that little bit, know a little bit about mechanic, mechanics, these shafts will go up and down and make these go up, go up and down. You get your quartz rock underneath that hammer, and uh, it hammers away, bang, 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 until it's all powder. And then you take powder and you can sift it like, from, like sand. But it takes a long time, makes a big row, and uh, by 1868-69, Thames had about 27 of these operating. And the noise was just unbelievable. Many of them ended up deaf. Um, they used to switch them off on a Sunday. And people couldn't sleep on Saturday night because it was so quiet. <laughs> but um, they brought these big stampers over on the Enterprise a panel steamer from Auckland, uh, although some were built on the site as time went by. 
um, they needed to get a means of turning this shaft if they're going to operate. So they built a lot of big pad wheels in the bigger creeks. We only really got a couple of big creeks there, and that's the Karanga, the uh, Karaka, and the Hape, which are rivers that you'll see going down through Thames even today. Mm -hmm. And they were able to operate those huge big water wheels, which is the most efficient way to do it. However, a lot of these places were up, like the shot over, at the start there was a trickle of water, but basically it disappeared after a while, that trickle. So they had to bring, what they had to do was use a steam engine, bring a steam engine up the hill. So that was more heavy work. Uh, they also had these pelton wheels, which were, were smaller water wheels that were metal and uh, went in a smaller creek. So this is the same shot over uh, quite a lot later, about 1871-72. So you can see that our bank has disappeared. And now we have a shaft and we have a big steam engine operating that battery to crash the gold out of the course. Just another little example of what you can do with the dark base. Uh, I just read, you read a history book, it tells you Alfred Mendick and his partner William Howard pegged out their claim near the shot over, claim five days later. And this later developed into the Long Drive Mine. So I, I searched both their names and I can get the dates that they arrived at, at the, with their claim. Five days after uh, the shot over, um, boys, the Hunts and Clarksons and that had, there's, uh, that it's said that he was actually a friend of Hunts and ex intended to join in with that, that group but he was a day late so obviously he found another mate, that's what they called them, they always called them, I know was going to work with them, the mate, that goes back to Australian days. So he found his mate by the 22nd of August and the two of them uh, pegged out this claim which later became the Long Drive Mine, a very famous mine in Thames. Um, there was a little bit of problem in those first early days because the miners knew that if it was gold, it would combine with mercury. They had their pots of mercury in their pockets and they would crush the, the gold, the quartz perhaps with a hammer and put it in a, in a bowl with some mercury and it should really uh, all the gold should dissolve into the mercury if it's gold. But the problem was this stuff wasn't dissolving into the mercury. So it was a bit of a worry in the first few weeks that maybe they would just have false gold, which is not gold at all, it's just mica or something. So um, then Matthew Barry came along and, sh and showed everybody that he, he put some of this gold quartz sand into his shovel, put it on the fire and roasted it drove off these various sulphur compounds and amalgamated beautifully with the gold. So it was the sulphides that was causing the problem with the amalgamation. So here you see the beginnings of the Thames School of Mines. You've probably, a lot of you have toured it and seen that the chemistry labs are a major part of it all. This is one of the reasons, trying to get gold out of the quartz is a big chemistry problem and they needed to set it up very early on and they did um, to try to help the miners figure out how to get this gold out of the ports. So I was able to figure out exactly when Matthew Barry himself came, right in the first 60 people that came here. Then we have John Murphy discovered the gold reef, reef the golden age reef near the boundary of the uh, Forbidden Waiatahi block. Uh, I say forbidden because they weren't allowed to go any further up than uh, the shot over um, creek uh, because the Maoris hadn't uh, ceded that land. Or, or the Maoris were actually leasing the land to the miners. And the miners paid one pound each for a year's um, miners' right, and that was supposedly going directly to the Maoris. Um, but the problem was that James Mackay was taking the one pound off the miners but sending it to Auckland 
And Auckland was sending it to Wellington, and Wellington wasn't sending it back to the Maoris, at least not, not all the time, not consistently. The Maoris went, the Maoris got a lot, but they didn't, I don't think they got all of what was due to them, not all the time. At, at that stage, the Auckland provincial government and the national government in Wellington, well, it's, they didn't exactly get along. <coughs> and poor old James Mackay was not being paid. He wasn't getting the money he needed to pay all his good wounds for his office. He had a, a, a contingency of constables, half of whom were Maori. He had them armed. And when these miners kept straying up into the Maori land, which was anything north of the shot over, uh, the Maoris would find them, escort them back. But it just became more and more difficult to stop those miners going up into the hills. And in the end you got these constables, half of them were Maoris, armed them and got them up there rounding up miners and bringing them back to town. But poor old James Mackay had a real headache because he wasn't receiving the money from the government to pay for all of this. In the end James Mackay went to Wellington to try to sort it out. He threatened to resign and the government knew full well that they couldn't manage the Maoris without James Mackay, who by this time was pretty friendly with them all. And he was trying to negotiate the Ohini Murray goldfield, but he still hadn't got there when he threatened to resign. So the government started sending them some money at that stage. They also started sending the Maoris some money because if you're trying to negotiate another lease deal further up the river, you really need to take uh, care of the lease deal you've already struck with the Maori. Uh, Jane, Daniel Turkey is also um, another person who struck gold real rich at the Moana Tairi Creek and developed the old Albany. I probably didn't pronounce that. He used to call it Tubby's Flat. Yeah, right. In that area. Yeah. So anyway, just remember. Doesn't matter what, even if you're not doing genealogy, if you're reading history, you can use the gold miners database to take a look at uh, these guys and see they are really pe real people and when they arrive. Also follow when they left as well if you know what you're doing. Okay, so now I just want to give you a quick look at what the shot over looks like today. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my husband, Evan Lewis, has taken all these um, shots. And I'd also like to acknowledge my two experienced guides, Dave Wilton, the archaeologist from the Treasury, and a local identity, Graham Pierce, who both uh, guided us safely up here. You'll see what I mean by safely in a minute. And this is me standing, I think, where the, roughly where the shot over was. But don't do this unless you've got someone who knows what they're doing. Don't slip down that bank and straight down the shaft. Um, shafts are everywhere through here and you'll be standing at the top of the gully and looking straight down 120 feet into a shaft and sort of just grass going down into it so don't let your kids loose up there either. <laughs> They're very steep. But this is what it's like today. It's all shafts. Originally it was just pick and shovel on the, on the cliff face later. Deep, deep, 120 feet down. That's what it looks like if you go inside one of those shafts. This uh, photo was taken by my son, Craig Lewis. He loves exploring things. Mm. He was supposed to be in uh, bed, I think he was about 15 or something <laughs> at the time. Next thing I know, he's up there photographing inside these shafts, in the dead of night. But he got some lovely shots. So you can see they just followed the mother load. Doesn't matter if it went straight down. And uh, somehow picked away at it. Of course, a lot of these shafts have been opened up since the original 1868-72 work. Because the work here continued on through to the 1920s. And so, not, you know, there's no telling when exactly this was done. Okay, go back to some treasury photos again. Um, right here on the right hand side, unfortunately nearly out of the photo, 
is the mining surveyor's office. And we've got a couple of pubs as well, one of which is a temperance hotel, the other is not. <laughs> <laughs> they say there was 27 pubs in town in the very early days. Oh, I've got probably more as time went by. Um, but the mining office I'm interested in because, and these may have been the surveyors, but they made a lot of maps. We have maps of just about all the big mines in the Treasury. So if you do get interested in one of the mines, by all means check the Treasury out. They have a lot of mine, mining maps done by, no doubt, these guys here. Notice the road. Mm. Terrible dust in the summer and turns to mud in the winter. Um, Brownstown in 1868, so we're up above the town as what that we call Thames today. Lots of boats and big pad of steam was coming from Auckland. Did they always come from Auckland on the boat? Or did they come no, always on the boat. There was no road, apparently. Well, I guess there might have been a car <coughs> but apparently not. everybody came this way. It was simple, quick, and a lot of them went back a lot because they needed supplies, not only food, but also mining equipment, big hammers or whatever they wanted to try to crush this gold. They, when they arrived here in Thames, they thought it was going to be alluvial gold because most of them were Australia, from Australia or Otago or West Coast, where it's all alluvial gold. You just go into the river and pan it and there's all this dust and it's easy for an independent miner to get himself a little bit of gold. But when they came up here, they had these huge mines and shafts and reefs all clinging to this quartz. Very heavy work. And until they could crush it, they couldn't get their gold. And they had no money to get it crushed. As time went by, the government set up some crushing batteries down in town so the men could bring their gold and quartz down to the town, get it crushed. But it all cost money. You first you had to get your ore onto a cart, horse or whatever, get it down to town. Some people started to build tramways down to town. And then of course there was an expense to get it crushed. And then you didn't know. They got somewhere between two and three ounces per ton of ore. Um, well, two or three ounces wasn't really that much as if it took you uh, uh, maybe a couple of months to get that ore, that one ton of ore, uh, out of your shaft and down the hill. Others, re those really uh, famous mines I'll outline later, got up to 400 ounces a ton. But there were very few of those, and by the by then most of them were owned by mining speculators from Auckland. So the poor old miner really didn't get a lot out of it. How much are uh, about the three pounds thirteen shillings. I think that photo is taken from the Union Hall. Just in the bottom yeah. left might be the Corrigan Creek coming around there. Yes. And Irish Town, the big knob. Yes. That's right. My grandmother was born in that little house right in the middle. Notice all the, the chief. all the houses up there. But it was unbelievably steep. Believe me, I climbed up there. Uh, how you would carry something like a tent mm -hmm. like that up there, or all this. I mean, it, this used to be a carry forest when they arrived in 1867. And as you can see, there's not even a bush left. They just clear fell it all as quickly as they could to get at the reefs. Um, the Maoris were supposed to be getting 25 shillings for every carry tree they chopped down. I don't know if they were counting quite honestly, but they're all gone now, along with the Karikatea trees as well that were there. Oops. This is the old Golden Crown Battery in 1868. Today you can go and visit this, it's called the Gold Mine Experience. You pay to get in the door. It's very interesting. Uh, and there's their shaft. They had to bring the ore out on the little trolley and into here where they had a stamper. 
with a steam engine. I guess that's another shaft there. And the minus, um, minus colleges here. This was an, an, a different claim. This, this here was the Golden Crown battery. All of these early mining records are in the Gold Miners database. Um, for instance, the Golden Crown, but you, you can't put Golden Crown in because the database is, is, is geared for searching really one name, like a surname. So put Golden or Crown in, but not both. Just search Crown. You'll get the golden crown and any other crown there happen to be. Um, just put one word in and you'll get them. And this is inside the um, museum, the, the, the gold mine experience, which is where they have a working stamper battery. This is the stampers, you can just see them there, hidden in behind all the structure. But the, the crushed ore came out of here and down onto this table. And you can see the sandy type stuff that we're getting from the crushes here. They will start it up for you and you can see the gold coming out. This was a, a bird arm which they used in those days to further crush the uh, ore and mix it with the mercury. Uh, I've just come back from Otago where I found at least two of these, one way up the top of the Mace Town and another one down on the Clutha, both marked AG Price temps. So I was very proud of that. But this this uh, actually goes round and round using this steam power again on that shaft which circ circles that around, all made in Thames. Is that, on, is that the old Queen of Beauty? No, this is the Golden Crown. Well, the Golden Crown site. I don't know where, where that came from. Whether it was or not originally there, I, I, I don't know. But they've, they've restored all of this equipment, probably bought it from other mm. places, put it all on site and got it working, which is great. This is an old retort. So you put your mercury amalgam in here, You've got to heat it up a certain amount with these coals. The mercury will vaporise, collect down here in this bucket, and back in your retort you'll find your pure gold. So we've reached the end of the process. And then of course they would tip their pure gold into here, and then tip it into here and make an ingot like that. But all of this was um, being done over at the School of Mines, constantly for the smaller miners who couldn't really have all this equipment themselves. They could get it paid to get it done at the smaller mines, so that's why they had to operate. <coughs> this is the old long drive. Um, there are notices like this all around town that show you where the mines were. Um, go for a walk, watch out for them. Of course this is private property but it used to up here be the long drive shaft. I'm just showing an example of um, searching it on the gold miners database again. So I put in just drive and get up, get the long drive. So we see the date when they first became a company. Um, the miners had to take out miners rights. And obviously there was a lot of shareholders, so they were able to get a lot of miners' rights in a lot of area. Duke of Edinburgh was one of the shareholders. Um, that was Prince Alfred, who was the second son of Queen Victoria. He came on a trip to Australia and had a quick visit to New Zealand. Unfortunately, he didn't make it down to Thames, although it was, the, was his intention, because he loved gold mining. So uh, he and several of his contingents the um, various lords and things took out uh, shares in this long drive mine. So the people here were well aware that the prince was one of their shareholders. The richest reef in Thames was the Caledonian. They took 140,000 ounces 
some signs of typo there. It was taken up in 1867, but then changed hands. They used to sell their claims, when that, mostly because they didn't, couldn't find the financing to get the um, stamp of battery installed. So they would sell the whole claim. And in the end, the uh, Caledonian landed in the hands of Fred Packard, a Canadian. I found that out in the history book, so then I look up uh, Fred Packard on the uh, database and I can see that he's been there right from the start. Must have found some money, got some money in, uh, during his time, and eventually was able to buy, buy out the Caledonian. Um, other early mines, the All Nations, the Kuranui, which was in, in, near the Shotover, the Maranatai, all very wealthy, rich mines. But the ones who actually got the money were the speculators from Auckland or even London who put the money up to finance the original mine. It's still the same today, in a way. It's the shareholders of mines that make the money, not the guys who are slaving in the mine. Um, I've just put up this quick sketch plan of the Thames Special Area, but I'm, I wanted, as an example, the sort of maps we have at the Treasury. Unfortunately, we can't really um, see the, the, what each of these names are, but you can visit the Treasury or you've got this great book, Downey, um, who's put claims of all the old maps. Map, all the old map claims have got uh, separated out. But all the originals are at the Treasury now. And that new archive building I've shown you, hopefully we'll be able to do some conservation work and get them. At the moment they're in pretty bad shape, but it'll all happen in a good time. Maunatairi Valley on the right side of this picture. And you mentioned Tukis Crown Claim, this is it here. This is uh, Tukis Claim here. And as you can see, they're well aware of the fact that Prince Alfred is part of the deal here, so they named the hotel after him, even though he never visited Thames, unfortunately. Another butcher shop here. And all the hard workers slaking their thirst at the pub. Caledonian, like I say, the richest uh, claim was up here. And this is just a bit north of Thames Township today, just as you go around the corner and start and up to Coromandel. And this is up the creek of Maanatai area, a little bit further up. Um, another pub up here, Rainbow Hotel. They're never far away. There were a lot of miners up here, they had a shaft up here and here's the tramway coming down to take the, got the courts down to the flat where they've got their battery. Like I say, just, the batteries are just too heavy to bring up here, plus they need a steam engine, plus they need a lot more water than they've got up here. So there's only one thing to do and that's to build these tramways. Some of these tramways were built by the mining company, big mining companies, others were built by the government, the provincial government, for the smaller guys to use. I think the provincial government did a reasonably good job of making sure they looked after these smaller guys. They put in stamp batteries, public ones, they put in public pumps to pump some of the shafts dry, and they put in public tramways. These are some of the guys working up, up that valley. <coughs> Unfortunately, that uh, was Thomas Radford on the left. He was the mining manager for that mine. And that's uh, him there. He became the mayor of Thames in about 1893. And here's the, here's the guy that ran the tramway. Can't remember his name. Can't remember. Oh, yes, Hodge. J. Hodge. He ran the tramway. Other than that, I don't know who they all are, but it just gives you an idea sort of people who are working up there. All na all nationalities. Just a smattering of uh, yeah. Chinese. Yeah, that's right. Probably from the South Island when things were wore out down there. Do the Maoris ever get into mining? Oh yes. 
In fact, there's Maori miners rights on the gold miners database. Uh, if you know Maori's name, by all means, please search. Uh, they'd say probably about a hundred, the young guys, I guess. Their dad was, or their, was maybe getting the one pound miners rights, so money, they had plenty, the Maoris actually had plenty of money, so they could afford to do what they get, the miners, the gold mining equipment that they needed. One of the miners who took out a miner's right was named Dummy. Uh, and it just said in brackets, a native. If you don't believe me, search Dummy on the database. <laughs> uh, so here we have 1880 up there. Still no trees in sight, as you can see. This was a carry forest, as I have to keep reiterating. No, I don't think it was a um, Dave Wilton has found some old carry stumps up there just recently. In fact, there's a, 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 an article in the journal about it. But the Maoris were supposed to be getting 25 cents for every carry tree that was chopped mm. down. 25 pounds. 25 shillings. Up the car on there. There's nothing there now except an old stump, and we're so proud of this old stump. Mm -hmm. It's actually been burned. The stump, um, since Dave's an archaeologist, he digs things, and he's sh shown that that stump is burned. So presumably, a lot of this forest was mm -hmm. taken out quickly by burning. So I think probably by 1868, everything was gone, even before. Another uh, little shot of miners. The 1880s. A couple of kids here. Barefoot. I hope they weren't miners, but I don't suppose I'd be surprised if they were. Maybe they're just there with Dad. Maybe they would be from school. And yeah. Out there. <laughs> my uh, uh, my own ancestor's not in here, but he had a beard like all these guys have got. So I think that must have been the fashion. This one only goes when it wants to. Mm. Okay, yeah. Okay, so here we see this team special area again from the Karanga hat from the, from the Karaka up to the uh, uh, shot over here, shot over gully here. Didn't even warrant a name, it was so small. Karanga Nui. Karanga Nui. And anyway, eventually uh, James Mackay was able to negotiate that they could go all the way up here to Tower Roof, which they did. They spread out over there real fast. But in actual fact, the best mining was in this area. Dave Wilton took Evan and I up this track here. There's um, adits and tunnels all the way up. There was a town up here called Punga Flat. Mm right from the start through to the 1920s, they were mining up here. And the old, old Bernier mine up here, very rich mine. And uh, we walked up into this area here. Believe me, it's a tough walk. I, I really um, Did you go up through the Karaka Way or? Uh, uh, up, through, up through here, yeah. down the bottom here, up the way. To So this is the same map, but this time it's showing you the reefs, the dark lines of the reefs. Of course you can't really see it that well here. So we've got the shot over here, and you can see, this is the river, this is the reef. Creek, well, it doesn't exist, the river, creek doesn't exist anymore. This is where we walked up, and we've got three reefs up there, so you can see why they've got so many tunnels up there. And then you've got more reefs coming down here and over to the Hape River and the Una Hill there with its reefs up there. But the reefs on the whole were going down the river valleys. And they were rich, up to 400 ounces per tonne of quartz if you got in the right spot. You've got to get right on it though. And as soon as you're off it, you get nothing. Robin, am I running out of time? No, yeah, fine. Okay, so we went on this walk up to Punga Flat, and this is what it used to look like. 
many years ago, at the very beginning, they started uh, coming up here, bringing all their equipment, which wasn't easy. Um, you can see way over in the distance, over here, the uh, Harrick Golf. So they were up in the sky, and they always, the miners always mentioned what a beautiful view they had. And apparently at night, you were down in Thames, you could, it's like stars all over the mountains, way up there, the candlelight, and the lanterns of all these miners on the hills at night. The tents, and slowly started building worries and things. But here, here we are, we've climbed up and we've got the same view, so basically we're up there where they are. Yeah. Not a very good day. But thank goodness it was cruel, because I doubt I'd made it up if it was hot. <laughs> but they were building their worries out of the punga. Had your punga up there? Made nice worries. There was a whole town up there. There was a pub and a store, and there was a track, and they took um, all the stores and stuff up that track. That's the same track we use today, I suppose. But all the way up, we're finding these adits, more going into that reef I just showed you that goes up this valley. But they're everywhere. Actually, that one there, you can see the quartz on the top very clearly, which means they're really close to the reef. <coughs> I'm doing what I want. I put this photo in to tell you not to do this, and that is don't stumble around there when you can't see what you what you've got your feet on. Yeah. You've got to know that you put your foot on solid ground because there's adits and shafts all over the place. But that's the kind of growth we've got up there now, which was the Punga Flat Village once. And everywhere we walked, we saw this kind of thing: mining equipment. And since Dave Wilton was there guiding us, he knew where all this equipment was and has um, documented it all for the records. Oh, I'll bucket the seen better days. This was all probably 1920s stuff, actually, but who knows when it, when it had its heyday. Oh, minus spade, well worn. I mean, way before this was abandoned, it had seen a lot of work. And a handmade boot, leather boot. And lots more of these shafts. Now we've, I've gone round to the Alburnium mine. I showed you further over to the right on that map. Um, and that was a big mine, 4,000 ounces of gold between 1871 and 72. And lots more than that, actually, but that's what the record was for that year. And that's the view you get, which is Thames Town as it is today. So you, this is part of the stars that, that the people from Thames could see. We'll see I'll burn your mine up here and all the workers. There would have been possibly 100 to 200 people up here from in 1871. Maybe more. This is all that you can see of the Alberta mine that's left. Um, that may have been a battery, I don't know whether they managed to get a battery up there, but there's no water up there, so maybe not. Maybe this was just their house, their you know, office or whatever, I don't know. But just behind me, by the way, um, Dave pointed out a, flax, a, a clump of flax, and he said, just stand there and listen, and he grabbed a big rock and he threw it into the clump of flax. And then about four seconds later we heard it clank on the bottom of the shaft, 120 feet below. So you can see all this flax around the place. Don't go stumbling around it unless you've got somebody like Dave with you to tell you where to go. And I can't say enough about Dave's work and his knowledge and the contribution he's made to what I'm saying today. And, and you, can, uh, and read, uh, you can read all his work at the Treasury webpage, the journal. A lot of his articles there about all his experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's actually a, a lecturer at Massey for, right now. He's resigned at the end, he's resigning at the end of the year, and he's going to become a full-time archaeologist out there for the Treasury. So we can expect a lot more in the future. Maybe you can figure out when this building was actually built.
One of those vertical shafts was, a, he said, a thousand feet deep. I think yeah. it was on Panga Flat. Right. Mm. You better put a GPS on in case he disappears. Yeah. He does, <laughs> so you know where he is. Mm -hmm. yeah. He has a GPS in the article, so he does and gives you in the journal, has the GPS the coordinates, so if you want to follow in his tracks, you okay. can. Mm -hmm. I've searched the Albania since I was up there on, on the gold mines database, and I can see that the mine actually got started in 1869. That's basically the main information I can get off the gold mines database. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots of boats there, and also Maori canoes, you can probably see there, in full operation. They were running up and down, and they used to sell um, peaches, um, as well, I guess, as kumaras. And they had a fish trap out in the, in, the, in the Gulf. So they actually did very well selling vegetables to the miners, and yeah, fish, fruit fish. and fish. And um, hopefully they made it a lot on the deal, because the... The miners were very grateful to have all this fresh food and only too happy to pay over a good bit of money for it. Gray, Gray Street. Yeah. Gray Street. Yeah, the post office, I think. That's it today. Yeah. Just to give you a bit of an idea, we've got some regrowth. But nothing like a carry forest or a trinketeer or whatever it was. Can you go back and then go? Go back here and go through? Thank you. Oh. Not quite as close, but if you go back further where that was, you can't actually see them as, as well. Um, and this is up behind the hospital, Karaka mm -hmm. Gorge. Um, and a lot of them were on this creek, especially in the early days. They thought they were going to get alluvial gold out of this creek, panning, and uh, they, they didn't, unfortunately. So a lot of men starved uh, because of that. They couldn't get anything. They were up here with no nothing. You can walk all the way up there. There's a trail, and the creek is down in the bottom of the gully. So Otago has alluvial gold, and yes. they pan there. They pan there. But although there are some reefs, but it was mostly the early guys were getting lots of alluvial. And somebody just mentioned this, James McKay's house. Oh. Yeah, here, and Chief Tyfree here. So Chief Tyfree was a really good friend of James McKay, the Gold Commissioner. And helped, no doubt they helped each other build those places next door to each other. So some money was getting through the Maoris. I hope as much as possible really because they lost a lot as a result of all of it. Gives you a good view of the um, the road up the hill that they were trying to get everything up. This is the um, inventory which is down on the flat quite a lot later. Bulls flat. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Uh, I like this here. Look at these deep ruts going up the hill. Where they tried to they tried to get horse and cart up there. Just dug into the mud. You can see that's got a water wheel there too on the side and the steam operated so they were hedging their bets both ways. Did they use ox Yeah, they may have. Because you know Near Coromandel, when they built all the big dams, they used ox to bring it home. I hope they said the way. We went up the shot over mm -hmm. uh, last week, and they told us there that the horses, the, the horses, life was yeah. six months. Mm -hmm. The mining horses. So they just didn't last more than six months no. on those, trying to get mining equipment up those hills. Well, this would have been much the same, I'd say. Yeah. Lots of little mining cottages when you look. What year is this? Well, we're not, we're not really sure. Did you hear it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Same place. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, <laughs> Wilden, um, Dave Wilden's photo, and he's researched this Una mine very thoroughly, and it's written up on the gold, in the uh, 
Treasury website, so please do look because he can tell you the story better than I can. This is just a close up of that battery. I'm very interested in the water wheels. You see the tramway coming in, dumping the ore into the top. You've got a steam tunnel, steam shooting out of the roof. And you can see those ruts going up the hill much better. So they did try to get bullocks or I'd say probably it is bullocks, but I don't know. And this is just a quick look at the Una mine itself, which is above from if you're looking at the hospital, it's on your right from so it's south of the hospital, up in the hill there. This was the shaft where they brought it down to the Karaka. They had a, um, a tramway that went out here and Dave's uh, been able to track the tramway all the way around to the Karaka Gorge where, where the battery was. Quite a few um, adits here, that's inside them. They were operating them right up to the 1920s and 1930s so it could well be that this was uh, work later than the 1872 period that I'm talking about. Because this is number four, they did a series of shafts going in right up the hill. And this, so number four, uh, I think it was below, but the Thames uh, Treasury has all of the maps of the Una mine. And this is just another quick example of the kind of maps that we have at the Treasury. All the claims carefully mapped out. Production records for the biggest mines. So the Caledonian being the biggest. And you can see it was double the next one. And Una Hill that we just looked at was one of the lowest of the main mines. Long Drive there that we talked about. The Prince of Wales being one of the beneficiaries. I mean the Prince of Eden, Duke of Edinburgh. Um, Kiranui, which is up the shot over area. Long Drive, yeah. He was a shareholder of Long Drive. Can I go back to the Luna battery? That was a very big battery. Was that just for the Una mine or was that uh, sort of a community? I'm not use? really sure. Can't, I couldn't say. It was a big yes, it was. And it could well be that it was a public one. It's very big. It's the biggest one that I've seen a photo of. And the reason I've put I picked it out because it's so big that we can see all the various things. I think this this tramway down the front was the public tramway, and that. But I and I don't really know whether this is the Una battery, but I think it was. I'm sure it was actually because Dave said it was. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm a little bit hazy here. And like I say, I'll refer you to the journal, the Treasury Journal and Dave's article on that actually has a big article there on the Una mine and, and he knows a lot more about it than I think. I think that was owned by Mr. Gibbons, the sawmill. That's saw right, mill. yes that's right, it is, you're right. Named after his daughter. And uh, there's a little um, article about him mm -hmm. in the journal too. Okay, so a famous mine but not really that productive, as, pro as productive as it could have been. The Alburnia where I was up there at the top with the shaft, third, the third biggest mine in Thames. But it was very isolated, very difficult to get it out. And so, in actual fact, it probably had a higher cost per ounce of gold to get that gold out than, say, the Caledonian, which was right down on the shore, mm -hmm. and no transport problems. So it's all part of the thing. They were selling shares on the streets of Thames. Uh, for all these mines. We had what we called Scripps Corner, which was a bit like the New York Stock Exchange, mm -hmm. only it was at Thames. And there were various stockbrokers whose job it was to sell the stock on the corner. It was a, so uh, you could... I wonder if they ever paid any dividends. Well, some of them did, <laughs> especially the Caledonian and the Moana. Yes, they did. Um, but a lot of them didn't. And you know, I think the Albania might have been one of the ones that failed to pay a uh, 
dividend simply because of their high cost of bringing the gold out. And uh, this, is, this is the gold exported from New Zealand all the way through, and I think it's interesting. When you just cast your mind down the, the, the middle row here, which is the number of ounces of gold exported from New Zealand, 1857 through to 1860, we're looking at Coromandel gold here. So you can see it gradually petered out and stopped altogether by 1860, more or less. Then 1861, gold is, is, caught, is found in Gabriel's Gully, so we're right up to 194. Things really got going there the following year. By 1862, gold was discovered in the Dunstan Gold area, which is Cromwell, Alexandra, um, Clyde, and then uh, 1863 up into Skippers. So we've got all these different South Island um, uh, mining areas working. 1864, it started to run out. Um, but we started to go, we went to the west coast. By 1866, the west coast was going flat out. Plus also, they had started up um, more dredging operations in Otago, which allowed a, a bigger production too. So we got up to 735 by 1866. 1867, along comes Thames. Um, so we've got both South Island, West Coast, and also Thames working 1867. 68, it's mostly Thames taking over here. And you can see that Thames started to drop off, and that was because all the easy courts had been taken out. They really couldn't manage any more, a lot of the mines to work. They'd run out of money. But eventually, by 1871, things got organised with big batteries, tramways. It all took time, mostly built during 1869, 70, and got started by 1871, we had the heyday of Thames. Mm -hmm. By now, Otago and uh, West Coast was pretty much played out and everyone was up here. Um, so from 1872, I noticed that when I was transcribing gold mining um, records that by 1872, there, there weren't a lot of people arriving in Thames. So that's why I stopped the database in 1872. Because from now on, you're really only talking about mining companies. Mm. And then the Waihee came in and the early got, 70s. Yeah, we can see it pick up there with the Waihee. And, um, and when did Waihee start? They around about, 73, yeah, that 73 Sorry. peak there, yeah. I think, is, is the Waihee. But Waihee has, has more or less kept things constant. Kareng Happy 2 started up at that time. Mm. Um, and of course, in the South Island, they started these big dredges in the Clutha River. Right through the 1880s, uh, we had mines in Thames. The big mines were still operating in Thames. The big dredges in Otago have kept things more or less going till now. So you can see a very constant um, flow of gold going out of New Zealand from through the 1880s and 1890s. Including pictures of the Otago mine. Yes, I, I just gave a talk in Otago, mm -hmm. in, in Cromwell, about the Otago. Um, I come to the end of my Thames thing. Mm -hmm. I go to talk about the Dunstan Gold mine, mine Wardens there. And you probably realise I'm also interested in um, the Warden from Thames and his work that he did. Um, so that's sort of a specialty, and the reason it's bu I've built up that is because, of course, it's the warden's records that I've been reading in order to, to create the gold miners' database. So I feel as though I've got to know these guys mm. very well. Is that maternal phrase as an early warden? They used to do a lot, actually. Uh, usually two or three in each district. Oh, so, oh, so, so interesting. Interesting. I'm hoping to take her in grey now. And on the back of them, you know, they have photographer's name and everything like that. And these were meant to be gold miners, so those dates can give me an idea of the dates mm. of these photos. Right. Would that be true? Yes. And if those guys were there, 66. later on, would they have been 
big company. Well, I can't, I, West Coast had alluvial gold and it still does today. So yes, you can, there's men working up there in the hills to, even today. And I've read quite a few books about old miners. local identities that slaved away up in huts up in the west coast right through the 50s and 60s and so don't don't give up on them. So you can source documents for this information up there of what I'm here? Well you can actually read all about it, see where it says Thames Mining Records in the, uh, in the database. You can, uh, should I shut that? Um, you can click on that. Otago and Thames, there. Click on that and all records that I've used and where they came from are listed there. So that means that you know what you've actually searched when you look search the database. But there's no West Coast. I haven't done that. Oh, you mean records exist but they haven't been transcribed? Yeah, they haven't been transcribed. Thank you. Exactly one year to the day. Just one year. Yes. So they and if pay you look, an annual fee. Yes, an annual fee. And if you look on the database, if they stayed there, you'll see the renewal. My own ancestor had three. So I know he was there for three years or two and a half or something like that. Yeah. Every year they had two and the mine at the gold warden used to go round and round them up and make the pay. And what happened? Claims where they became nullified, like they didn't want to mine anymore. What happened to the land and the mines that they were? Did they revert back to the crown or? I, I think they just reverted back to the crown because that's dock land now. Oh, is it? Yes. Um, so actually, that's been. I'm not sure it, exactly what happened. I mean, the Maoris owned the whole lot prior to 1867 and didn't want to sell it, they only leased it. So how we got from there to it being dock land, well, probably other people here are more expert at that than me, but it doesn't sound like too great. Yeah. Yeah. Any else? Yeah. 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 called Alistair Isdale and all of Alistair's original work is now in the Treasury and uh, he's, a lot of what I've talked about today comes from Alistair Isdale who was originally ran the School of Mines and now it's his son John and uh, there's still a lot of records on, at the School of Mines as well. The Terminology School, was that an educational area yes. or a you referred to the laboratories that are there. They, they were teaching. They were teaching. Uh, 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 teaching the miners. Teaching the miners. Night classes. I met somebody in Otago whose father was a teacher there and right up until the, about the 1950s teaching at the School of Mines. There was a School of Mines in Otago University as well, which I think Thames might have been a branch of, you know. Uh, they always, right when Otago first started, needed analysis of the golden ore. And the University of Otago started it, and I think they sent teachers down to Thames to get them started. And it, they were there in 1867, right from the start. Into Wyoming? Yes, that's right. The School of Mines at Coromandel too. So, you know, there were branches spread out. They used to run night classes. The miners were very well educated. You might think they just looked like a bunch of dirty old miners, but in fact, a lot of them were very well educated, attended lectures at night um, on all manner of subjects that the School of Mines got them, but especially on mining uh, technology. And that's how the miners learned what they had to do with their mine up there in the hills. They'd come down to the School of Mines and the lectures held at night by professors and all manner of engineers, surveyors, letting them know what was going on up there, how
how they could manage and how they could manage to make some money out of it. And the chemistry of, of mining was very, very complicated. No, no. I was at the Treasury in June for your research day. Oh yes, I, I wasn't there, but no, these are our private um, collection of photos and... No, <laughs> that's right. Um, the, the idea was I had hoped one day to give people an insight into gold mining areas by putting it on the website. But um, I guess I've got more work to do than I know what to do. <laughs> but yes, that, this week we went all through Otago, right up to Skippers Canyon and places a lot of people don't get. And my husband's a great photographer, took the whole lot. And uh, so now we've, it's all on here and one day I hope to try to get it out there. But I, I, I guess when I uh, pass along I'll probably donate it all to the Treasury. <laughs> Yes. Well, no, I'm a genealogist. Yeah. I've been a member since, I don't know, 15 years or something, New Zealand Society of Genealogy. Um, and I was hunting around for my great-grandfather, and I found out he was born in Tapu. I didn't even know what Tapu was, and it, that was in the days he couldn't just Google it or something, uh, about 15 years ago. And so I thought, eventually I found out that Tapu was gold mining. So that gave me the clue I needed to look up gold miners and I knew if he was born there he must have had a father and mother that was there, that's about all I knew, you know. Ultimately I got his birth certificate and found the parents' names and uh, but I knew, had said on the, his father's occupation was minor but there was no way to prove that he was a minor. There were no occupation type records. Eventually I made my way to the archives New Zealand in Auckland it all takes years because I don't live in the area. But eventually I got there, started going through the Miner's Right book, which is beautifully laid out. Copper plate script. There's even a little index that was contemporary with the, probably made by James Mackay himself. And below down there was my great great grandfather. There, and I found actually three Miner's Rights eventually. And I thought, these are beautiful records and other people have got mining ancestors and they're not going to be able to find it any more than I could. So I started, in those days you weren't allowed to photograph the records, but I started copying it out by pencil whenever I was in town. Wow. Uh, you only so allowed pencil, pencil and paper. Life. And it made my hands hurt, but I, then I transcribed them, so that's how it all started. But then later on, we were allowed to photograph them. So that's when the progress really was made because once again my husband well, I got pretty good at it too and we'd go in there and photograph a whole lot of the records and take them home and just slowly transcribe them when I had time. So now I've reached 50,000 records. <laughs> so it's starting to get to the stage and I was told at the conference in Otago starting to get to the stage where it's becoming a historical document of New Zealand gold mining. So. But it all started because of genealogy. Could I just say something with, it relates to Howick in a way. Rex, I thought you asked, asked about dividends. Yes. Did you? Well, Reverend Lush was the first vicar of Howick. And after he left here, he went to, he was itinerant for a while. Then he went to Thames in 1868, first vicar down there. And he invested in the Caledonian. And he got dividends from that, enough to build the big house in Thames, which is opposite now the Worthingham's Club or something now, isn't it? The Thames Club, mm -hmm. big two-storied house, and his cottage, U Elm in Rimiwera. So he he did well out of the dividends. Yeah, his great great grandfather fun works in the Pekarangan Library. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> some people did get dividends. <laughs> Um, and Lush's book, I can yeah. thoroughly recommend, he's got a diary, and he was right there on the goldfields right from the beginning, and tells all the stories. Um, he, he tells the story of James Mackay uh, and his family, because James Mackay brought, had a wife and children that he brought there to live in that palatial house on the hill, I just showed you. 
um, don't, and, and Reverend Lush actually talks a lot about the family and all the various anecdotes about the family, and so you get to know them a little better that way. Yeah. I think that house has Okay, have you looked at the New Zealand Gazette for the people as invested in the gold mining? Have I looked at the what? In the New Zealand Gazette? Oh, the yes, yes, the yeah. list in there. Okay. I haven't okay. put them on there because they're already uh, indexed elsewhere, I right. feel. So I'm only indexing handwritten records that nobody... I, I believe that the, the next generation coming up, and I have a son who's 22, he can't read handwriting of any kind. Right. Mm. And I desperately feel that I want to transcribe these records before the next generation comes along that can't even read them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably right, so. Yes, so I Robin, I think um, the audience should realise that. If Kay wants to research something, she doesn't hop in the car and drive down the road. That's right. <laughs> you should tell them where you come from, Kay. I actually live in Tennessee in the United States and I've been there for 25 years. <laughs> but I have deep roots in New Zealand. This is my second trip, our second trip back here this year. As we become semi-retired, um, we're coming back more and more for visiting elderly parents. So I'm getting more done. Can I just ask you a question? I spoke to you about the, the Stamper battery that was somewhere in the hills just uh, between uh, Tiara and uh, Matter Matter. Um, is, oh, do you know of any other... If I wanted to research that, do you know of anybody, say, in Tiara or anything that's doing similar to you? I think that the best person to, to contact is Dave Wilton. Oh yes. Yes. You can get you could get in touch with him via um, the Treasury. Yes. Um, if you just send an email to the Treasury, ask it to be passed on to Dave Wilton. You can see all his articles on the journal of the Treasury website, so you get to know him a little bit. He know if there's anything up there in those hills, he knows, or he'll go and find oh, out. Yes. I found a little bit on papers past, but yes, well, not, not, not a lot, and I, I was quite interested as to why, in say 1910, there was enough gold up their mine to support the group. Yeah. Because well, I think it's a fairly inaccessible place. Dave has done quite a lot of research up there in the Karinga Happy Gorge, and so I think if anybody knows something, he will. And as I say, he's resigning from his job at Massey at the end of the year, so. He's always looking for projects. Somebody recently sent an email, <laughs> sent an email to me about um, some mines. Uh, where was it? Just south of Auckland, on on the main highway to Hamilton, there were some mines, and they had it on their farm. They wrote to me, and did I know anything about it? So I passed the email on to Dave, and Dave's up there, I think, this weekend. Um, so what a wonderful person! He's an archaeologist. He just loves it. I seem to recall there's a book in the NZSD library called Stamper Batteries yes. oh. and that could well cover some of the some information of the that you're interested in. Um, it's just in the back of my mind, yeah. jumped out. It's a little story, it's a little novel about a family Is it? Yes. Yes. that lived in the Tookies Bath area. The Montmartre area. Mm. I've read that. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you are. <coughs> Is everybody else? Well, I was just going to read the latest Heritage magazine is a picture of the main town of Stamp Battery. Mm -hmm. ah. And I was standing beside it about three days ago. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and and as well as that, solid. Francis has pulled out some books that we've got in our library that are just up on that table there that, you know, that cover that sort of thing as well. So thank you for Francis. I should have mentioned that before. So there is a lot of information available. Yes. I'm really interested in Otago a site that we might find. Well, covers she included. Goldmine Star Space. Uh, Goldmine yeah. Star Base is covers um, Otago. Um, I can't offhand think of any other place. But you'll s there's 20,000 Otago records transcribed from, from Otago. There's more to come. Um, 
And by the way, I, oops, I was at a conference presented with this medal. Uh -huh. Gold medal. Oh, gold medal. <laughs> 50,000 records. I think so. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, 150 years almost to the day since the gold miners arrived at Dunstan Goldfields. And this, was, this is a commemoration medal. Oh. And uh, um, there's been a lot of publications. I went around various museums and things in Otago. Lots of publications for sale. People have been writing about it all. So, Try the bookshops online and find lots of things about it if you're interested. Same with the West Coast. Yeah, there's a lot of people publishing a lot of stuff now. Mm. Mm. Lots available in the NZ History Library if you need to look there. And as just said, that uh, Prophet has picked out some others that might be of interest. Mm -hmm. So, um, and as well as that, like and as well as that, if you're interested in the uh, website that Kay's developed and we've got the books on our table. We've got a few copies of them, not that many. There's so one dollars each yeah. and they're the uh, user's manual for the gold mines database. Um, if you're really keen to find out all there is to know about the database, um, then that's the thing for you, it's five dollars. We're selling them to raise money to buy that, build that archives and keep it going. It's, it's going to be hard to keep that going, um, we're going to have a full-time archivist and we get no help from the government or anybody. The council subsidises us, but mostly we've got to raise money ourselves. So. Begging, begging for donations. Begging for donations. Mm -hmm. You can also join the trust if you want, become a member and then you get news and things. Membership forms for the trust are on uh, the Treasury website on the front page. No, no problem. Well, thank you, Kay. I think you've delivered us a really interesting talk today, and I know lots of people have been very interested in hearing what you've had to say. Really quite inspiring. So, And thank you so much on behalf of genealogists for all the work that you've done for years and years. And I'd just like to give you a little token of our appreciation, and will everybody join the <laughs>